Welcome to Adventurer, the show with guests who truly push their lives to the limits. No talking heads here, just the real deals. I'm your host, Jim Clash. Virgin Galactic Airways has unveiled models for Spaceship Two, the eight-passenger craft destined to take tourists on suborbital space rides in 2010. They held an impressive press conference for sure, with lots of company execs presenting, including Virgin CEO Richard Branson and Scaled Composites Chief Bert Rutan. But notably absent on stage was astronaut Brian Binney, one of the main reasons we had all gathered in the first place. In 2004, he piloted Spaceship One to 69 miles above the Earth to win the $10 million Ansari X Prize for boss Bert Rutan and lay the groundwork for building Spaceship Two. After the proceedings, we found Binney alone, standing to the side quietly, and thought his perspective would be appropriate on this historic day. Now you piloting Spaceship One, they said it was a little bit difficult. What are the differences in flying Spaceship Two, as you can see from doing the simulation work? The changes we've made have really assisted the, the pilot in his ability to fly this boost profile. Um, with the conventional stick and rudders, we control the entire stabilator surfaces um, now as opposed to just the elevons that we did on uh, Spaceship One. Now, uh, for those people out there who've never been to space, and you're one of the 400 and some people who have, have having flown Spaceship One up, tell us what it's like, the view up there, because I think it's transcendental, right? Uh, you know, that the, the view is marvelous, and um, but it, it's, it's more than that. It's, it's really a whole body experience. Um, uh, you first got to remember you're riding a rocket motor for about a minute and a half uh, getting up there, and that, and that is not a... Uh, passive experience that even though if you just as a passenger sitting there uh, you are fully engaged your senses are pegged there's a lot of noise there's a lot of vibrations there's a lot of g-forces on your body and for a minute and a half you are saturated by that but at rocket motor shutdown it's as though somebody throws a switch and just like that the noise and the vibrations the shaking the shuddering the shrieking the shrilling of that rocket motor all disappears and right with it you become weightless and weightlessness means all the tension that was there is gone. Your limbs don't uh, weigh anything. Uh, the cabin is big enough. You can get up out of your seat and you just simply, you know, think about lifting up and you're floating. And you can drift to the nearest window and now you have this body uh, sensation coupled in with that view. And it is, um, it's, it's otherworldly and, and it's something, as I say, I cannot oversell this experience. I cannot spoil it for you. Um, uh, because people are going to come back and they're going to go, yeah, he said it was good, but he didn't tell me it was going to be that good. After the break, a chat with Natasha Pavlovich, one of the lucky tourists scheduled to go up on the initial series of $200,000 ticket flights. Then Branson and Rutan's own perspectives on when they themselves will fly and what an accident could do to dampen all this enthusiasm. I have with me Natasha Pavlovich, and she has signed up to become one of the first astronauts uh, on the Spaceship Two flight. I think she's the first uh, astronaut from the former Yugoslavia, is that true? Yes, I am. I will be the first astronaut from the former Yugoslavia. So, so Natasha, you went and pulled six or seven Gs in that centrifuge training in Pennsylvania, right? What was that like? Um, Surprisingly, it was not as difficult as I had thought. They'd made the seats very comfortable and the whole experience comfortable. We went through very adequate training in classroom. And uh, so when you know what to expect, um, it lessens the fear. I got to ask you guys this question. I've heard you're going to go up together on one of the first flights. Will it be the first flight? Uh, it, certainly, it certainly will. <laughs> and um, I mean, the, the first, as, as you say, as you call it, official flight. I mean, before anybody goes up. Uh, first commercial. The commercial, first commercial flight. Before anybody goes up, there will be uh, many, many flights um, with you know, qualified astronauts to get the teething problems out. And um, since I've got my kids, on board and my parents on board and I love them dearly. I want to be sure that it's a return return flight. What happens if we have an accident? Uh, in a, 
commercial flight. Will, will this fledgling space tourism program be able to weather that? I think, I think it's going to depend on what kind of an accident it is. If it was something that you can clearly identify and know that you can mitigate it and make darn sure that that cause cannot happen with your mitigation, then I think it'll have a very low uh, impact. Um, if it's something that looks more like a generic danger, uh, then it'll take a lot more work to get the confidence back. How about you, Richard, what do you say? I think if it, if it happened early on, it would, it, would be, it would be a tough one to overcome. Um, uh, you know, if it happened, you know, two or three years into the program, uh, that, you know, and it had been proven that the program worked, then, you know, that, you know then um, I think the program most likely would be able to continue. I mean, commercial airlines, do, you know, do occasionally have accidents, and, and it doesn't result in, you know, that all the commercial airlines in the world being grounded. Um, as, as long as you know what went wrong, um, you fix the problem and you move onwards. Exciting stuff for sure. I know I want to go. I'm Forbes adventurer Jim Clash. To read my column, pick up Forbes magazine or click on Forbes.com slash adventurer. And thanks for watching the Forbes.com video network.